uh, good to be uh, a part of this uh, beginning of the new year at the Newman Institute uh, for Catholic Thought and Culture at the University of Nebraska. And it's good, of course, to be with my old friend and colleague in Newman Studies, Bishop Conley. What I'd like to do tonight, uh, somewhat informally, rather than from a prepared text, is to introduce the life of John Henry Newman and the principal outlines of his thought. And then to speak specifically about several aspects of the thought and its importance for us today. Why John Henry Newman? Let me give you a few anecdotes to begin. The first of them was at a conference, and I don't recall Bishop if you were there. A number of years ago, Archbishop Bruno Forte was asked this question uh, Would one not say that Hans Bruce von Balthasar was to the 20th century what Newman was to the 19th? seems a fair question on the surface, and he said immediately no, because Balthazar's language remained Balthazar's language, but Newman's language became the language of the church. Now this is related to the often quoted uh, claim that Newman was the father of the Second Vatican Council. That is in some ways misleading and in some ways accurate, and I'd like to speak about both those things. How did Newman's language become the language of the church, and what was his role in shaping the experience and deliberations of the Second Vatican Council. I want to argue that he does have a fairly specific influence on three conciliar documents, Lumen Gentium, uh, Dei Verbum, and Dignitatis Humani, the Declaration of the Constitution on the Church, uh, the Constitution on uh, Divine Revelation, and the, and the Declaration on Religious Freedom. But I'll speak about that toward the end of the lecture. Finally, a couple of other anecdotes, which are perhaps worthy of recounting as we think about the influence of this pivotal figure of the 19th century. Pope Benedict XVI has a long devotion to Newman, uh, who shaped his uh, theological reflections as a seminarian immediately after the Second World War, especially on the level of conscience, but also on the question of historical development, the question of how truths can change and remain the same. Uh, when Benedict XVI became Pope following the, the long reign of John Paul II, in which John Paul presided over so many applications in Rome, hundreds of them, uh, remarkable, and Benedict was trying to reduce the fundamental role of the papacy in all aspects of the church's life on this public scale, and he reverted to the old order of the applications in which the local ordinary reside, and the location in which the Beatus of Beata had lived. But of course, he broke his rule immediately. 2010, when, in fact, he presided over the application of John Henry Newman in Birmingham. Bishop Conley and I were there together uh, for that event. It was uh, particularly moving uh, because of uh, Benedict's own devotion to Newman, and I've had a chance to speak with him at some length about this. He's publicly declared on many occasions that one of the great disappointments at the end of his pontificate was his inability to canonize Newman and to declare him doctor of the church. And he said, had he been able to do so, he would have declared him the doctor of conscience. So I want to return to that question at the end of this initial introduction. Finally, two last anecdotes. One of them is the story which is compelling to me of the deathbed of Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, the great uh, philosopher of the 20th century, who had been baptized a Catholic uh, as a child but largely moved away from religious belief. Toward the end of his life, as he was dying, Elizabeth Hanscom, the friend of him, of course, they became very close. And she tells the story that around his deathbed, they had, uh, they had asked whether he wanted to see a priest. And he said, yes, I do, but not a philosopher. <laughs> so, so the Dominican convent of Hepler went, and uh, as Wittgenstein uh, was dying, uh, he was there. But the interesting thing was that Franz Kahn noted was along his bedside was the full set of the Pope and Plain Sermons of Newman, which had been what he was reading as he prepared for death. Those sermons, which are such an important part of Newman's legacy, are something too that I'd like to touch upon briefly. Um, finally, the great uh, interpreter of uh, Thomas's moral theology, Sergei Pinkers, in a 1999 article in Communio so that much of his life now was focused on reading the Prophet and Plain Sermons of Newman. That it was important that Thomas be interpreted in the light of modern thought, and he thought one of the people most able to secure that 
a modern uh, connection was John Henry Newman. So Newman has many witnesses uh, to the role he's played in contemporary life and his importance for the church. But as we know, a doctor of the church is named not simply because of his or her intellectual contributions to the life of faith, but also because of the life that was lived itself as a life of holiness. And so I want to spend the first part of this evening with you talking about Newman's life, uh, which was an exceedingly long one. It roughly spanned the entirety of the 19th century. Newman was born on February 21st, 1801. He was the oldest of six children of a middle class English family. His father was a banker in London. And he had a conventional upbringing. The family was, uh, I wouldn't say devout, but regularly observant uh, Anglicans. Uh, he, uh, they had evening prayers together as a family. As a boy, Newman memorized most of the New Testament. And so the, the, the language of the New Testament was not something that he referred to, but something he, he lived. And when he preached, he never read from the text of Scripture, because he had memorized it. And so he spoke from memory whenever he preached, which became a complication for him when he became a Catholic, because, of course, he had been <laughs> memorizing the wrong book. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, uh, Newman was uh, an unusually devout child, so much so that his father warned him about becoming too excessively religious. His family was um, divided, and of course, uh, when Newman became a Catholic in the middle of his life, uh, his relationship with all his fellow and his other siblings were broken. He had two brothers, uh, the older of which, Frank. Uh, Francis uh, eventually abandoned religious belief largely and kind of informal deism. Uh, the younger brother, Charles, uh, literally uh, became mad and became an atheist. Uh, he had two surviving sisters one of whom broke off all contact with him after his conversion, the other retained very little contact with him. But let me move to that pivotal change. So you see, the young boy grew up in London. He was sent away to school, to Ealing School, uh, I think at the age of eight. Um, and he was there uh, considered to be the most brilliant pupil in the school's history. Uh, he had a capacious memory, he read broadly, he had a great talent in a wide variety of fields and had very wide interests. Uh, he was particularly intrigued by mathematics, and that was the focus of much of his study when he went to Oxford. So his life is fairly conventional, but at the age of 15, he had a deep conversion. It was, in fact, following upon a long period of reading uh, very atheistic authors, Voltaire, Locke, Hume, uh, and he said how terrible the thought of Voltaire, but how plausible. So, and this is the age of 14. So he began to have a sense of the air of infidelity that now was permeating the European scene and increasingly uh, became uh, the reality in England as well. But at the age of 15, under the influence of one of his schoolmasters, an evangelical Christian, uh, Walter Mayer, he had a deep conversion, and it was a conversion that changed his life entirely. He was still under the influence of Calvinist theology, but it wasn't formally Calvinistic in its orientation, but we can say it was somewhat evangelical. But he came at the age of 15 for the first time to the commitment of the truth of Christianity, to the truth of Christianity, not to some sense of the warring of the heart, not some evangelical appropriation of the idea of predestination, but he came for the first time to know that Christianity was true. And it changed his entire experience of life and of his vision for his future. About the same time, he also had the sense that he was called to celibacy. That is, he was called to live a, a, a single life. This was not so much as a disciplinary uh, sense of life. That is, he had to give up something in order to enter into the mystery of the cross, but rather that he was set aside for some purpose, and it would require him to leave the comfort of the, uh, of the world's own um, security for something which would allow him to enter into the uh, the, the teaching of the kingdom in a new way. At this time, of course, he hoped to be a missionary uh, to foreign lands and was very much involved in the Bible Society and uh, imagining that this would be his immediate future. At the age of 15, he matriculated at Oxford and he eventually enrolled at Trinity College, uh, one of the uh, more considerable uh, colleges at the time at Oxford. He came and he established a prodigious reputation for scholarship. He received a scholarship in his second year. 
uh, for nine years, which became very important later. Uh, his studies were again rather general. At this point, he hadn't thought about a career in religion at all. He was planning to go into the law, and his focus was on mathematics. Uh, and he planned to go to Lincoln's end following the termination of his undergraduate study. He studied very diligently, and he was carrying the prestige of Trinity College as he entered the final examinations. But like so many incidents in the lives of the saints, Newman had a sort of breakdown before the schools. He was going in, he was studying um, uh, typically up to 18 hours a day before the final examinations, and he had a sort of physical uh, and moral breakdown at the schools, and he passed under the line. He ended up with a poor third class degree, which made it impossible for him to think about going to um, pursue law as he had decided. But he still had a scholarship which allowed him to remain at, at the university, and he took on private pupils. By this time, his father's business had failed, and he also had to take on the uh, financing of his brother's education, so he was working diligently to do this. He stayed and his mind turned more and more to priesthood, to the church. And eventually, he applied for the most prestigious fellowship in Oxford at Oriel College. At the age of 21, he underwent that examination, and to everyone's surprise but his own in some ways, he won that fellowship, which was again the most distinguished uh, position within the university system. So he began his now career as a Don and Fellow of Oriel. Uh, eventually, again, he decided to seek ordination in the Church of England in 1824. He was ordained a deacon. He was assigned as a curate at St. Clement's Parish in Oxford, in the center of the city. A very large parish, uh, urban parish. Uh, and he decided that he would visit every household in that parish, 2,000 households in St. Clement's Parish. And he visited them sequentially. He went to them. Many of the course were not Anglicans, they were not parishioners, they were they, they might have been dissenters, they might have been evangelicals, they weren't a part. But he visited them nonetheless. He began visiting the sick and, and visiting homes and baptizing children. Uh, it was a prodigious uh, work of, of his priesthood in the first phase of it. He was ordained the following year in 1825. And eventually he withdrew from that parish assignment because he became the vicar of St. Mary of the Virgin Church uh, in Oxford, which is the University Church in Oxford. Uh, if those of you who have been to Oxford uh, would see it, it's a, it's a lovely, lovely, largely 14th century, the beginning of the 12th century church in the center of the city. And there he began his preaching, which became world famous. Uh, T.S. Eliot said that he was the best preacher in the English language of all time. Uh, James Joyce said he was the greatest pro stylist in English. And his sermons had a transformative effect, particularly on undergraduates, who would flock to hear him. In St. Mary the Virgin, the undergraduates would sit up in balconies, uh, they, they weren't on the lower level, and they would be at the high level of Newman because the public was, was raised. And they spoke about the way he read their hearts, he disclosed to them feelings that they had never known about the deepest instincts about life and faith. He had a prodigious impact on a generation, in fact, several generations of Oxford students, and his fame spread. He had come to Oxford again really as an evangelical. Uh, he had uh, a fairly general sense of scripture as the foundation of, uh, of the faith. Uh, and when he was at St. Clement's, he began to doubt whether um, the evangelical tradition was a system pastoral mode of forming uh, people's lives. Uh, he was struck by the fact that scripture remained uh, fundamentally unauthoritative. One could read it according to one's own disposition. The question is how it secured a commitment to and participation in the truth of God's life was far from clear to him. And so as he began to continue his work in the fellowship, he tended more and more to what is called a high church position. He began to see the church's authority as fundamental. He began to believe in the apostolic succession, the importance of the episcopacy, the role of the bishop in securing the unity of the church, the intellectual clarity of the church. And eventually he began to read systematically the fathers of the church in the first period of the church's life, and particularly the Greek fathers, even more than the Latin fathers, although he long had a great affinity for Augustine. But his chief influences were the Greek fathers, and he had this deep sense in that tradition of deification, that we are made for divine life, that we are really made for 
uh, participation in God's life, and that the great dignity of the Christian is not something to sort of gradually and incrementally become a better person, but to be transformed, literally, in God's life. He said there is no reason we do not participate in the holiness of St. John or St. Paul. Uh, the only reason we do not is because we don't recognize the dignity of our conversion, the life to which we're called to be. So in 1827 to 1828, Newman is now 26, uh, almost 27, he had what might be thought of as his second conversion. And this one came under the influences of suffering. His youngest sister, Mary, died uh, very unexpectedly at the age of 19. She became ill one afternoon and died the next day. Uh, and he couldn't, uh, he couldn't get her. She was his closest sibling. And uh, at the same time, he was supervising the schools, that is, he was examining students for degrees. And he had another physical breakdown based on overwork. And he felt providentially, as we think of so many cases in the lives of saints, how illness and bereavement enter in to change the course of their lives. Uh, Newman thought that he had been saved from uh, a singular preoccupation with the intellectual life and then drawn back into the need for a fundamental conversion of his life to the truth. Uh, so he uh, continues his work then at uh, St. Mary the Virgin. And eventually, he becomes more and more concerned about restoring the authority of the Church of England, which, uh, as you know, was an Erastian church. That is, it was under the direct supervision since Henry VIII of the English state. So it became effectively a political organ more than it was an authoritative ecclesial body, even though it had retained an ecclesial system. And the catalyst for this was the decision of the English Parliament to close half the diocese in Ireland of the Church of Ireland. And this was done solely on the basis of political concerns about not antagonizing any further the Irish Catholics who were taxed to pay for this church. But Newman realized that if, in fact, Parliament it fundamentally redefined the hierarchy of the, of the church on utilitarian grounds, there was nothing which would be immune from their uh, interference. The church must be a unique and authoritarian voice, and it could not be simply a state church. This led him with others to begin what became a very important movement called the Oxford Movement, uh, which was designed to affirm the church's historical rights Newman argued that the Church of England was the Catholic Church in, in England, uh, that there were three branches of Catholicism, the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Churches, and the Church of England. So the branch theory that each of these could claim appropriately to represent the Catholic Church uh, within a particular geographical domain. The difficulty was, as Newman soon discovered, is that although he was arguing for apostolic succession, that the bishops, bishops were the successors of the apostles, the bishops themselves didn't think they were. And so the more he argued the principle of Catholicism, the more opposition he encountered uh, from within the church itself. Uh, the Oxford movement was initially focused on a series of tracts called Tracts for the Times. Uh, Newman wrote the first and by far, by far the most of them. Uh, they began as uh, quite simple exhortations, initially directed to the clergy to resume their commitment to the the authority of the church and to assist their bishops uh, to realize this vision of Catholicism within it. This did not go well, although in the beginning it seemed to be going well. Shortly before the tracks began, he had gone on a voyage to the Mediterranean with his close friend Earl Fruit and Fruit's father, Archdeacon Fruit. It was his first encounter with Roman Catholicism because they visited Rome, they visited parts of the Mediterranean. And Newman had very mixed reactions. You know, he had always understood that Rome had to be the antagonist of Anglicanism, that the Church of England really couldn't claim the right to exist unless Catholicism was corrupt. And so he began to try to sort out his experience of Catholicism. He visited the Venerable English College in, in Rome. He uh, met the rector there at the time, later Cardinal Wiseman. Uh, but he stayed away as much as he could from Catholicism because he was uh, afraid of its implications. Eventually, during that trip, he went on his own to Sicily, and he suffered a great illness, um, probably cholera. Uh, he nearly died. Uh, he lost his hair. He was uh, weakened. He was uh, saved only by his guide, who stayed with him in a very faithful way. And he began his trip back to England. But interestingly enough, during this illness, he said, I shall not die 
I have not sinned against the light. I have not sinned against the light. There is a work awaiting me in England. So he returned in 1833 uh, to England to take up this work, uh, which eventually embroiled him in enormous uh, controversy within the church. He was the great leader of this movement. Uh, W.G. Ward said famously that uh, Credo and Numana, our belief is in Newman as the leader of this great renewal. And he took this work up with great cost to himself. And he secured it over a long period of time uh, against great odds. The odds continued to increase until 1841. By 1839, one would have to say he'd lost confidence in the ability of the Church of England to make the claim to be a Catholic body. Uh, he tried to argue that it was a middle way, a via media between Protestantism and Catholicism. But he said eventually this was a paper theory. It never existed in fact. It was simply an attempt to make sense of the dilemma. In 1841, he published the last of the tracts, Tract 90, uh, which focused on the argument that the 39 Articles of Anglicanism, which were the basic creed of Anglican commitments, uh, which one would have to subscribe before matriculating in Oxford or taking a degree at Cambridge, in fact were capable of a Catholic interpretation that a Catholic could subscribe to the Articles because they didn't critique Catholic dogma, they simply critique Catholic devotion. And therefore, uh, they were not fundamentally uh, addressing the core of Catholic belief. They were simply addressing Mediterranean temperament, right? Uh, the tendency in uh, Roman Catholicism to a certain kind of devotionalism, a great emphasis on piety and Marian devotion, which was uh, for Newman at a certain period of time and for many Anglicans highly problematic, the idea of uh, prayers to saints, uh, the, which uh, seemed to impede the fundamentals of devotion to Christ. 1841, the great crisis. Uh, Newman is censured, uh, forced by his bishop to withdraw from the tracts. He uh, begins to withdraw from active engagement in the life of the Church of England. He retreats to a little village outside, which he had begun uh, to develop as a place of meditation called Littlemore. It's about three miles outside of the city of Oxford. And it's actually under his jurisdiction, a vicar of, of St. Mary the Virgin Church, because it was a parish which belonged to uh, St. Mary the Virgin. And uh, so he began uh, to retreat and to try to make sense of his dilemma. Could he continue in the Church of England? Uh, it was the case for Roman Catholicism now compelling? This was not just a matter for him of intellectual reflection, but a, a fundamental discipline. He went into a quasi-monastic existence, uh, fasting uh, deeply, especially in Lent, but throughout. They kept the liturgy of the hours. A group of his disciples followed him there. Uh, they lived a, a very regular and, and hard existence because he, he knew that discerning the truth in this case was not merely speculative. Right? The truth was fundamentally existential, and he needed to know this uh, in different ways and to overcome any illusions he might have brought to it. He withdrew his accusations against Catholicism publicly. Um, he had said that he had believed that the Pope was the whore of Babylon, that, um, the, uh, you know, that Rome was so corrupt that, in fact, uh, having any uh, uh, relationship to it was contagious. Um, he withdrew those accusations. Eventually, he withdrew more and more from his commitment within the life of the Church. He resigned uh, his uh, role as vicar of St. Mary the Virgin, preached his last sermon as an Anglican in 1843 called The Parting of Friends. Uh, which left the entire congregation, both in the church and outside, weeping as he laid his stole over the altar rail and left that church. So from 1843 to 1845, he was increasingly withdrawn, and he began writing uh, a very important theological work, uh, which he left unfinished, called the Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine. Because one of his chief, chief obstacles about Roman Catholicism was that it taught authoritatively things in later centuries which it did not teach in the first centuries. And his vision was that the life of the Christian intellect was complete in the first ages of antiquity. That is, that in the Christian period, that the fullness of Catholicism had been realized, and anything that would be added beyond that would be a sort of corruption of that primitive teaching. He found that both historically and theologically, this is not possible. He wrote this text, an extremely important text, uh, in which he talked about the reasons that not only faith may change, but must change in order to remain the same. 
one of the most famous lines from that text is, um, in another world it might be otherwise, but here below to live is to change, and to be perfect is to change often. So for the first time, as a, as a Catholic theologian, he begins this reflection on the question of history, the relationship of time and truth, and how, in fact, truth is capable of development in order to retain its original insights. This text continues to be the most seminal work of its kind. When Cardinal Rossinger was in uh, at St. Thomas in 1984, he talked about the fact that the seven knows about which one distinguishes between a truth and a corruption remain the most powerful means by which one can make that distinction. I'll say a little bit more about that later. So a very important seminal text. At the end of it, in October about 8th, uh, Blessed Dominic Barberi is traveling through Oxford. He stops at Littlemore, coming in through a driving rainstorm. He visits Newman, and Newman asks to be received into the Roman Catholic community. Newman is the most distinguished intellectual figure in the country, and uh, frankly, no one was becoming Roman Catholic in those days. Catholicism was a remnant of requisite families and a large number of immigrant Irish, very poor and uneducated. So he moved to Catholicism with having very little direct experience with Catholics. Uh, he began a general confession that night, which lasted into the night and into the next morning with uh, now blessed Dominic Barberi. That was received into the church, and uh, Father Barberi celebrated the Mass in the chapel in the little war, the altar, which is still there. Then the question is, what now? Uh, Newman is 45 years old. Uh, he always was a sort of chronic invalid, thought he would have lived long. Of course, he lived almost 90. Uh, but he uh, wasn't clear what his opening would be. He didn't think initially that he should be considering priesthood. Uh, it wasn't quite clear what he would do. His life, uh, which had been largely organized around writing, uh, his whole audience for that, of course, in the Church of England was now gone. So he wouldn't expect any you know, income from that. He wasn't quite clear what to do. Bishop Wiseman, who was the, the vicar of the, of the Middle District in England at this time, encouraged him, invited Newman and his followers to come to Oscott, uh, to what became Maryvale, uh, near Birmingham. And they went there, uh, established a community, and he, it was decided that Newman would be sent off to Rome to study, which is fairly ironic since he was the greatest deal of during his day. But he was sent off to Rome, propaganda theater, and he left in the fall of 1846, uh, lived in the college of propaganda theater. I was talking with Bishop Conley about this. One of his classmates there was the first bishop of Omaha, a uh, priest, a much younger priest than anyone, of course, who lived there in the college. And they retained a, a friendship over the years and a correspondence. So Newman was there. It wasn't clear what uh, direction he would take. He didn't think he had a vocation to diocesan priesthood. He considered the Dominicans, he considered the Jesuits, but they were too hard, he thought. Uh, the Dominicans were too soft. And so eventually he landed in the oratory of St. Philip Mary. Uh, he did his novitiate uh, after exploring the oratory uh, at St. Croce in Rome. He was ordained uh, on June 1st of 1847, uh, said his first mass at a chapel still at the College of Propaganda Fide, and then returned to England in December of 1847, and began his Catholic life. He established the oratory in Birmingham, not in London, as expected, he wanted to stay out of the politics of the city. He wanted also to serve the needs of the poor. Newman spent much of his priesthood for dealing not with highly educated people, but with the poorest of the poor of those days, Irish immigrants, uh, many of whom were not only uneducated but unwashed. Uh, there are stories of the hours he spent in the confessional in the heat of the summer when it was almost uh, overwhelmed by the stench of the confessional. But this for him was what the life of a priest was. It wasn't simply an intellectual apostolate, although he was in, very heavily involved in it. He began a series of lectures uh, uh, around uh, the country, and particularly in London, uh, where the most eminent figures of the state would be there, Thackeray, George Eliot, Dickens, uh, would come to these lectures more out of curiosity than perhaps of faith. But he did, in, in fact, have this intellectual apostolate. And he also began an heroic work of correspondence. There are 33 volumes of published correspondence, and uh, most of these about five or 600 pages in length. And this is only a small portion of those that uh, we know were written. So much of this day was spent either receiving people or corresponding with people who had doubts about their faith or were looking at, to, 
to uh, uh, find a way of converting to Roman Catholicism. This went on for a few years. Uh, in 1851, he was approached by uh, Archbishop Cullen, the Archbishop of Armagh, to consult with him about creating the Catholic University of Ireland. Uh, and eventually he was asked to be the rector president of the Catholic University of Ireland. This was, of course, a, a great benefit, though the work was largely a failure. It was a great benefit because in the course of it, he wrote and delivered uh, the first portion of the discourses uh, which now constitute the first half of the idea of university, which is a, the most seminal text on the nature of university education and its relation to the church. It uh, continues to inspire not only the Newman centers, which we see around this country, but also a great role in shaping uh, St. John Paul II's vision of the university and export of crazy. <coughs> so he did that work. Uh, he needed to be superior in Birmingham, so he was taking a ship back and forth across the Irish Sea. He never got the support he needed, he thought, to fulfill that uh, expectation. He eventually withdrew in 1858 and returned to Birmingham, and then he found himself in controversy again. Uh, because he was asked to take over, which he initially rejected, asked to take over a lay journal called the Rambler. And in the course of it, he wrote a very famous essay uh, called On Consulting the Faithful in Matters of Doctrine. And this essay was eventually related to Rome for heresy. In it, Newman said that the faithful should not be understood simply as the passive recipients of the church's teaching. Because the church holds in the bosom of its life uh, the, the truth that the faithful and the teachers of the faith uh, embrace that fullness of truth in the full sense. Right? That they are not simply being taught uh, by the teachers of the faith, but in fact coming into possession of the truth of the faith. And the dignity of the faithful, and it's important, everybody translates this as I'm consulting the laity in the matter of doctrine, but in fact it's I'm consulting the faithful, because Newman used this term ambivalently. But the faithful, he thought, included not only the laity, but also priests and religious, who are not part of the hierarchy. Right? So that, and they too have a possession of the truth, which is not simply one that is passively received, but actively lived and participated, as we see in the lives of so many saints among the faithful. Well, this was not rightly understood, although it became very important, because uh, in fact, uh, this uh, recognition of this truth uh, was in fact acknowledged by Pope Pius IX when he declared the, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. And he sent a letter to all the bishops of the world consulting them about the appropriateness of this definition, which had a, a debate in theological history, right? Some of the greatest saints of the tradition were opposed to it. And yet he knew that this had been received by the church in such a way that from the devotional point of view and indeed from the theological point it was appropriate for the church to move to address this, and he declared uh, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, the two principal uh, theologians of Rome, especially Peroni, said that without Newman's essay and development of Christian doctrine, that definition could not have occurred, because the notion of history, change, and development made possible the fact that the church did teach in the 19th century something which it hadn't taught in the 18th and still be continuous with the great tradition. So after this, uh, the Bishop uh, Brown uh, delayed Newman to Rome for heresy, which led to great confusion because it was unclear what the specific concern was. Obviously, the concern was this. Uh, the teaching of the church can't depend upon the vote of the Catholic world, right? I mean, the faithful are those who embody the truth and are committed to voting out its claim. So it's not as if one's going to take a poll and make a determination about whether we should change the teaching of the church. But this was the initial reaction of many, including Orestes Bronson, the great American Catholic convert who accused uh, Newman of heresy as well, eventually reconciled. So from 1859 until 1864, Newman largely withdrew. He published nothing, he spoke rarely, he retreated into the realm of his oratory. But in 1864, Charles Kingsley, a very prominent figure, uh, wrote an essay, and it was in fact a review of James Anthony Froude's uh, text, historical text, in which he said that the truth has never been a great value for the Roman Catholic clergy, as we see in the life of John Henry Newman, and suggested that Newman had lied 
as an Anglican about his uh, hidden Catholic commitments. Well, Newman was curious, and a correspondence began that drew him out of his isolation. And this lasted for a period of time, and eventually it led to the weekly uh, publication of the chapters of what became the Apologia of Sua, the apology for his own life, which is one of the great classic texts, not only of apologetics, but of religious autobiography and Catholic tradition. And amazingly, Newman became the great hero of the uh, English world. Uh, even Anglican apologists who saying that he had completely vindicated. The great literary critic uh, Hutton said that no better sacrificial victim had been given to the knife of Newman uh, to be sacrificed on the altar of truth. And in fact, it was a great rehabilitation. So 1864, he resumed his public life in the church. Uh, he had earlier, uh, by the way, been accused of libel by uh, a former Dominican priest who was uh, guilty of sexual excesses. He was found guilty in court. The, the fear was that he would be sentenced to prison. So this was a series of disastrous moments of failure in his life as a priest, and many people were predicting that he would leave Catholicism and go back to the Church of England. And he said, he eventually wrote a letter to the Times and said that he would never leave the land of milk and honey for the wasteland of the Anglican community. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about this is that Newman is still, and in his own day, was considered a great ecumenical figure because he never abandoned his love of so many of those friends of his in the Anglican communion. And he thought as well that the Church of England was an important bulwark against infidelity, and that, in fact, to try to hasten its demise, which he thought was inevitable, would be a strategic mistake. So he continued to have good relations, unlike Cardinal Manning, who was much more sharply contentious with regard to the claims of the Church of England. So 1864, the great rehabilitation, but then a series of additional failures. He's hoping to go back to Oxford to establish a house of studies that's blocked. He's misunderstood. Um, eventually, he publishes his last major work, an essay made of grammar of dissent, which he reflects upon the relation of faith and reason. And then he's invited to be a paratist or a theological expert at the First Vatican Council. Pivotal time in the life of the church of the 19th century. Newman, even before he became a Catholic, had been a strong advocate of the infallibility of the church. He thought that one of his key notes, and he had discovered in writing the essay on development that this gift or charism of the church was fundamentally exercised not by general councils, but by the papacy. And he was particularly struck by seeing uh, Leo's tongue, the intervention of Leo the Great, which transformed that council and secured orthodox consent. Nonetheless, he didn't think it was necessary or even appropriate to declare the doctrine of papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council. So he was opposed to the definition, not to the reality. He'd been invited by Bishop Dubanlou of Orléans to be an advisor, and he'd been invited uh, as well uh, by his own bishop in Birmingham. He, he refused, partly out of real humility. He said he was not really a theologian and lacked competence. But he also wanted to avoid the politics of all of this. Pine the Ninth was pressing the definition. Uh, many English clergymen, including Cardinal uh, Manning, were very heavily pressing for a strong papal definition. And uh, he was cautious. So he was embroiled in this, and many people were saying Newman was not a loyal Catholic because he didn't support this uh, decree. And uh, so there was this sense that somehow he was withholding. He was uh, maintaining his own freedom of will and not loyal to the magisterium of the papacy. Well, as you know, the First Second Council was suspended, uh, was not completed, and the definition that was eventually passed was a very moderate one. It wasn't a strong, overwhelming uh, definition, and, and Newman, after a brief pause, was very content with it and, and argued in favor of it. And he was forced to argue in favor of it in a very important occasion, because in 1874, uh, the longtime liberal prime minister of England, Gladstone, uh, published an essay in which he said that the papal definition was an abuse of the entire Christian tradition that it gave to the papacy a kind of tyranny of power, which meant that no English Catholic could be trusted uh, to serve in the, the military or par the parliament or public life because their principal allegiance was not to the crown but to the pope. And so Newman was asked by many people, including his own bishop, to write a response to this, which he did in 1875. <coughs> and it was published under the title of A Letter to the Duke of Norfolk. Uh, 
It's a very important document, one which Benedict XVI stresses, uh, its reflection on the relationship of conscience and authority, uh, both stressing the, the importance of both, but talking about their interdependence. You know, there was that famous uh, line, uh, he said if he was asked to give an after-dinner to toast to the Pope, he would give a toast to the Pope, but he'd give a toast to conscience first. Now, many people today say, well, this is another example that he's, uh, you know, liberal, that he's not faithful to the papal magisterium. But in fact, his whole point is that the conscience is the basis of papal authority, that the authority of the Pope is uh, within the context of the moral law, and that, in fact, conscience is not an antagonistic principle, but a complementary one. 1875, he publishes this article. Again, uh, there were attempts to suggest that this was seditious, um, Archbishop Manning, to his credit, said, no, it's the greatest uh, uh, assistance we could have had. Eventually, to everyone's surprise, uh, he's uh, first named uh, the first honorary fellow of Trinity College, certainly the first uh, Catholic uh, to be honored by Oxford. And then in 1879, shortly after the death of Pius IX, Leo XIII becomes Pope. And in his first consistory, he names uh, him a cardinal of the Catholic Church. He's created the cardinal in 1879. Leo XIII had come to know of Newman and the Oxford movement. I was surprised to learn just the other day that, in fact, he had a visit with Dominic Barberi on uh, uh, October 16th of 1845, just as Barberi was coming back from receiving Newman at the church. Hetchy, uh, later Leo XIII, was the nuncio in Brussels for many years and uh, was very much aware of currents in the church in England. So Newman was, was created cardinal. The last years of his life were, were lived in Birmingham at the Oratory. He died at the age of 89 on August 11th of 1890. Uh, a great figure. So now let me turn to the question of uh, Newman's language becoming the language of the church. In what way is this true? Um, it is the conventional phrase that Newman was the father of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, that's in some ways misleading. It is true, we know, that his name was cited more than any other theologian on the conciliar floor in the debates of the council. His direct shaping of documents is uh, less clear, but I, I agree with Father Carr on this, that his most immediate contribution were to the two constitutions, Dei Verbum and Lumen Gentium. Dei Verbum, because in his early reflections on Revelation, uh, he stressed the fact that revelation and scripture are distinct. Scripture is the privileged expression of revelation, but revelation is a living word, and it's not reducible uh, as such to the, to the human language of scripture. So there's a, always a tension between the two, which is uh, clearly affirmed in uh, Dei Verbum as well. And with regard to Lumen Gentium, of course, unlike the document on the church in the First Vatican Council, uh, Lumen Gentium is committed to this broad vision of communio, the, the communion of faith, the Eucharistic uh, mystery of the church's uh, being. It's not so much to be conceived as an institution, but a living mystical body, which in fact incorporates the faithful and uh, the hierarchy into a unified uh, reality. Finally, Digitalis Humani, just briefly, the most controversial document of the Second Vatican Council, I suspect, uh, which is seen by conservatives on the one hand as a fundamental change, and by liberals on the other hand as a kind of fundamental change. Liberals <coughs> praise it, conservatives condemn it. I think Newman would have seen it as continuous, that is, a development of earlier teaching in the light of new circumstances of uh, faith, and um, that certainly would fit into his scheme of, uh, of development. But finally, a last word on conscience. Um, I mentioned Pope Benedict XVI's desire to name Newman the doctor of conscience. Newman famously said that as a child, he came to the deep experience that there were in the world two and two only luminously self-evident beings, God and himself. So that at the very heart of this experience of reality was his sense of the personal relationship of God. That is, that he couldn't conceive of God without a sense of his own relationship, and he couldn't conceive of himself except in relation to God. This interpersonal, this communion of persons, so Trinitarian but so richly Christological, was for him in the heart of his experience of life, and it explained everything about the way he engaged reality.
So it's often said that Newman's principal argument for the existence of God is not the famous proofs of Thomas, which he said he found entirely credible, but not, not alleviating the spring in his heart. They didn't warm him. They didn't give him a sense of the truth. And a very famous passage at the end of the, the beginning of the first chapter, fifth chapter of the Apologia, he said, when he looks out at the world, he sees no trace of God. It's as if he looked in the mirror and didn't see his own face. So the notion somehow that we could turn to external reality and uh, the, the notion of divine providence and the, the, the creative uh, power of, the, uh, of harmony and beauty and find God proofs for the existence of God. No, he says in our time, the proof of the existence of God is in our hearts and in our minds. It's in the conscience. The conscience is that point where we're most deep into our own interiority and where we discover God in fundamental ways. Now, the fact of the matter is, though, that to do this requires the authority of the church, because we cannot go into ourselves fully unless we have the confidence that the truth is available to us and we're not lost in the quagmire of our own self-contemplation. It is the authority of the church which is fundamental to this. And when Newman became a Catholic, he was struck by the fact that the only Christian church which claimed infallible authority was the Roman Catholic Church. And in fact, if the church is not infallible, we're left in this position of uncertainty, of probability, of mere opinion. But we can't commit our lives to the truth of the faith unless there's an authority which can allow us to be certain the fact that we can gain access to it and it can teach us. This was, for him, fundamental. So the, the relationship between conscience and authority is not a divided allegiance, but in fact a fundamental complementarity of allegiance. Then at the 16th, that's this wonderful image in a meditation he did before the bishops, American bishops, in 1991 in Dallas, in which he talks about the papal office as having a minutic function. The, the office of the papacy is a, is a nursemaid, a, a midwife, that brings into awareness the truths which we hold interiorly, but we're often not conscious of. We're not, we, we, we intuit them, they nourish us unconsciously, but in fact, we, we cannot access them without an authority external to us, which can disclose and bring to, to awareness, bring to consciousness what those truths are. So Newman is the great figure of the 19th century, but I would say he remains the great figure of our own time as one of the great prophets of the Catholic revival, and someone who brought the deepest questions of modernity, the problem of time and change, the problem of conscience, the question of development, Think how often these questions emerge right now as we're talking about the pastoral implementation of the Mars Laetitia or other questions. How do we determine what is a true development? How do we determine where conscience is normative? What is its relationship to the authority of the church? He remains a very rich uh, theological and philosophical figure. Finally, the sermons, they are uh, the most uh, heart-bewildering, penetrating sermons, I think, of modernity, both his Anglican sermons and the Roman Catholic sermons, most of which are not um, uh, published in the way the Anglican sermons was because he spoke from memory and occasionally from notes, but they are a rich spiritual trove. Uh, I mentioned the impact on Sarah Spinker, the great uh, Thomistic moral theologian, and on um, uh, Wittgenstein as well. Uh, so I would recommend if you were going to pick up anything of Newman, it would be the Parochial and Plain Sermons as a starting point and then uh, to move from there. So I think I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
unifying governance of the church. In the beginning, the role of the bishop, uh, it seemed not to require a universal magisterium, but rather a local one. So that's a development. Development and understanding of, uh, of Christology, the development and the understanding of Trinity. You know, we, we have at Nicaea the first major uh, uh, Christological development, the, the argument that in fact Christ is, is fully, consubstantially God, as the Father is God. And then uh, later in Cassini, the declaration that Christ has, uh, is one person of two natures. Uh, this is logically inconceivable, but nonetheless it's a, it's a matter of faith because we have to keep in the right order relation the divine and human elements at the heart of the incarnational mystery. So we have a whole series of very important developments in the first centuries of the church that tend to be Christological and Trinitarian. What is the relationship of Father, Son, and Spirit? Uh, how are we ordered to one another? But then this continues on. You know, we don't have the full definition of the numbers of sacraments until the Middle Ages, uh, the definition of transubstantiation, which again comes in the Middle Ages. So we have the, the, the developing teaching of the church on a wide variety of issues. Some of them are devotional and some of them directly theological. Dignitas Humanae is the Declaration on Religious Freedom. That is that um, religious uh, belief cannot be imposed. Uh, now, this was seen as suggesting that uh, error could be tolerated, right? That if you can't impose the truth on people, this seems to suggest that relativism is an inevitable result. Actually, what's being talked about here is not the right of the church to impose its teaching, but the right of the state to demand religious conformity. And that's something which is not often recognized by many people who object to this document. And of course, the fathers of the council thought that we no longer lived in Christendom, right? We no longer live in the time in which uh, Christianity and Catholicism in particular is the religion of a culture, the religion of the state. And so therefore, you had to acknowledge the reality of pluralism uh, while still insisting upon the teaching of authority of the church to declare the truth and to demand adherence to it. Nonetheless, um, the real concern in Dignitas Humanae is about the attempt on the part of secular cultures, particularly communist cultures in those days, uh, to uh, destroy the right of religious freedom. So it emphasizes religious freedom as a good, not within the ecclesial context, but within the larger cultural context of the time. But again, conservatives objected to it, like people like Archbishop of Feb, which this began the great break of that community, uh, that the church was moving away from its authority um, uh, to, to demand adherence to the truth. And then liberals saw this a great change because they thought this is great, it opens the door to you know, uh, individual judgments, uh, private judgments about reality. I don't think either one of those is quite right. It's the, it's the continuity of teaching and the light of change circumstances. It's like the change in the teaching of the church on usury. Uh, you know, where uh, the, the charging of interest had been condemned uh, uh, at a time when, uh, you know, the basic financial structure was uh, material and land. Uh, when you move into financial uh, arrangements of a different sort, it had to modify that teaching. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Yes. Um, could you tell us a bit about Newman's novels and yes. how a reader should approach his novels? Yes. Um, they are wonderful, actually. Um, uh, Newman was a poet, a musician. He played the violin quite well. He had a great uh, interest in classical music. Um, the, the first of the novels, Loss and Gain, was published shortly after his conversion. And it, it was published anonymously. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, Bishop Wiseman had published a novel before him, and I think there was a little bit of jealousy. <laughs> so he wrote Loss and Gain, which is a wonderful reading. Uh, he always said it wasn't autobiographical, but I think it was in many ways. You can certainly see Newman in it. It's the story of an undergraduate at Oxford <clears throat> being caught up in the um, turmoil surrounding the Oxford movement and trying to negotiate the way in which he could be faithful to his deepest instincts about Christian life. And eventually, it's led into Roman Catholicism. It's a, it, it's quite good. Um, he then wrote an historical novel. Uh, which is probably, from the point of view of literary style, uh, a, a better novel. Uh, it's uh, considered by far his uh, more accomplished literary work, although I continue to be drawn to Lost and Gain. I, I, I confess a preference for it. Uh, 
Um, Newman, of course, lived in the world of the early church, and so he described this with great skill. Uh, as a poet, he was considered the best of the poets of the Oxford movement, uh, but that's not saying a lot. Uh, <laughs> although, of course, one of the most famous poems that he wrote, um, uh, which was uh, now known as The Kindly Light, uh, which was originally titled The Pillar of the Crowd, Kyle, and he wrote this on the voyage back from the Mediterranean, on the road to the voyage back to uh, England. And it's uh, now a great hymn, both in the English Catholic tradition and the Anglican tradition. They both sing it regularly. Also set to music is a portion of the Dream of Grontius, his great poem on uh, the transition to death. And, uh, the, the great hymn is um, Praise to the Holiest in the Height, an extraordinarily powerful uh, hymn. So, so Newman was multi-talented. He had a great ear for language. His great stylistic influence was Cicero, which is a mixed blessing because uh, those of you who know Latin know that Cicero's sentences can be torturous. There is a there's a sentence of Newman in the essay on development, which is two pages in length. <laughs> Uh, these, these compound complex sentences which carry you along, and they're musical, they're quite lyrical, so if you read them aloud, they carry you remarkably well. But I think students in their first encounter with the style are intimidated by <laughs> So again, yeah, the novels I, the novels are certainly worth reading. They're not dated the way some of the novels of the period. What was the title of the historical novel? Yes, isn't it terrible? Calista. Calista. So it's Newman's work on conscience throughout. He has a number of sermons on conscience. He has a long reflection on the role of conscience in the idea of the university. But his most consistent work in spelling this out is the letter to the Duke of Norfolk. It's a great read. Uh, it's, a, it's an occasional work as so much of Newman's is. Uh, but it provides a very good introduction to the nature of conscience and its relation to ecclesial authority. So that's the first theological principle. The other one is certainly, which uh, Rotzinger would say, but it, is development doctrine, the, the question of, uh, of truth. But, you know, Ratzinger came to his seminary studies immediately after the Second World War, the great tragedy of his experience. He was a prisoner of war, he was involved in, you know, the German Youth Corps and so forth. And one of the things which struck him in looking at the tragedy of Germany, which was a great Christian nation, is the evacuation of conscience. That, in fact, Christians seem not to be animated by any deep sense of the moral evil which they were encountering and their own relationship to it. So conscience was for him really critical. And he was struck, as Newman was, that today we have this artificial notion of conscience as self-will. It's just a subjective voice. It's an inner voice which we listen to. But for him, it's the voice of God, the voice of God within us. And so uh, we turn to it not of the, consult the consultation of our own inner life, but in fact to seek the truth that we're part of our being. So conscience is really the key question for Newman, and certainly is for eventually Benedict XVI. Of course, Benedict was not the only pope who expressed the desire to canonize Newman. John Paul II did, Paul VI did as well. But uh, Benedict was particularly shaped by Newman's theology. Uh, the others less characters. Yes? Yes, you talked a little bit about um, you mentioned the beginning about how uh, Father King Harris had said that uh, Newman's theology would be for the best transition using Thomas as obviously one of the great factors in the church. Yes. Um, how, how you might make that transition in other some pieces, for example, conscience. Thomas talks about an operation, not the study of the power that 
Newman seems to talk about more than actual power. Yeah. Um, what, are, what are some ways you can make a transition from Thomas to Newman to kind of dialogue in the modern world? You know, Newman, uh, Newman went to Rome thinking that he would be able to study Thomas for the first time. I mean, he was immersed in the Fathers, so he never really studied the medieval scholastic tradition at all. And then he got to Rome and he found nobody was reading Thomas. No. Uh, the scholastic uh, method was largely abandoned without any clear alternative to it. It was only later in the, the pontificate of Leo the 13th, uh, Karen Patrick's, that in fact the recovery began. Newman always thought that his views were entirely compatible with scholastic thought, and with Thomas in particular. And when he was preparing to write the essay in Native Grammar of a Stent, he, he, he studied Thomas carefully. Uh, particularly on, uh, about the questions of faith and reason, but also the moral uh, teachings. There's a very helpful text in this if you want to pick it up at some point. It's kind of hard to find these days, called The Philosophical Notebooks, written by an English priest, Edward Seelan, who looks at, uh, tries to situate Newman, particularly Newman's philosophy, but also to a lesser extent his theology, in relation to a set of the philosophical traditions, uh, the empirical tradition in, in, in England, but particularly the scholastics. Uh, Seelan himself was uh, the of the train, of course, of his time. And it's helpful, I think, you can see the, the, the comparison of language and the compatibility. You're right, it's a different language. Newman, Newman said he was not a philosopher or a theologian because he didn't have that training, you know? And he used language in very colloquial uh, and informal ways. And, and this can be a problem. It's also an advantage, I think, because you don't have the rigid categories which are important for clarity, but perhaps not so important to enter into the mystery of some of the questions under review. And so Newman's accessibility on that level, I think, is this sort of strength in the But ceiling would be helpful. Yes? What can you say about the genesis of the Latin genesis of Newman centers at universities? Right. And uh, how should uh, Newman centers in your opinion live up to that? Well, uh, you know, originally the Newman centers were designed uh, to provide a Catholic presence uh, within the university system, the secular university system. And when this happened, um, you know, the universities were, I would say, uh, essentially still participating in the classic understanding of university education. They, were, they had inherited the great tradition of classical and medieval thought, and they had a strong emphasis on liberal education. And therefore, the role of the Newman Center was relatively limited. It had to provide liturgical life, sacramental life, and pastoral formation. Uh, now the university is deformed, shall we say, right? The modern university no longer participates in that great tradition. Its, uh, its education is merely technical. Uh, it's presiding over a set of disciplinary fields, which are intended to offer a set of skills which are applicable. Its, its whole understanding is utilitarian and specialized. So I would say that the Newman Center needs to move in the direction that we see here, the Newman Institute for Catholic Culture, which not only uh, provides um, you know, pastoral formation, liturgical life, and sacramental life, but also intellectual formation uh, that complements uh, this integrated vision of the world and the world. So I, I am persuaded that we need to move to fulfill the promise of the Newman Center in, in a way it's got to have that intellectual piece very much at the heart and center of it. Otherwise, what happens is not merely the continuing fragmentation of experience among college students in their experience of education, but compartmentalization. And by that I mean that, you know, a student might be taking part in um, focused studies, Bible studies, and uh, then go off and pursue his studies in engineering, and then go and live in a residence hall, and, and then come to Mass at the Newman Center. But, the danger is that each of these experiences is compartmentalized, it's isolated, right? So you, you don't seek to integrate all these things into one life, you live a set of lives that you try to balance. And this is the language of modernity, live, live a balanced life. Forget it, that's not enough. We, we need an integrated life, and a life where we need, we need to live one life. The life of faith can't be marginal. You need a sense of what it means to have the vocation to, to work in the world. All these things must be one reality. So this is why I'm so excited about the work that's underway here. And I'm involved in a few other programs around the country that are attempting to do the same thing. So the classical model of Newman um, centers was more focused on the Catholic presence by uh, formation, liturgy, and sacramental life. Now I think it's going to be moving uh, to a fuller, um, more complicated relationship. 
have one, one more question. Is there a question to ask? Yeah. yeah, could you give a like a nutshell version of Newman's understanding of what a well formed conscience would be like? What are the prerequisites as opposed to like what we're hearing from like some of the more is a modern progressive theologians of let your conscience be your guide sort of thing. Yeah. Well, he, he insists that, you know, one of the reasons the conscience is so badly understood is he said that today it's understood as the right of self-will. You know, the conscience is just the right to do whatever you please. But the conscience, the dignity of the conscience, which he called the aboriginal vicar of Christ, is in fact that power, uh, both of, within us, but also understood solely in relation to the authority of the church. The Christian is for Newman never an individual, right? The Christian is a part of the church, and therefore it doesn't seek to understand the immediacy <coughs> of its obligation, so <coughs> in terms of the operations of the conscience, but to seek clarification from the teaching of the church about how we're ready to read the conscience. And so that formation, uh, he was very insistent upon the importance of an examination of conscience at the end of every day, something almost no one does anymore, but it's fundamental to living the Catholic life well, I think, so that you're attentive to what he called the importance of the small things in life. I mean, most of our lives are not going to be determined by some great heroic action. It's by attending to small things well and making the appropriate sacrifices to live them with, with, with integrity. He has a beautiful reflection called The Road to Perfection, in which he says, you can, to be perfect is not, um, it's not easy, but it's simple. It's easy because if you get up, if you get up on time in the morning, if you begin with prayer, you know, give the day to God, you order the day to God, uh, you say a rosary, you eat, uh, you know, uh, carefully and not excessively, um, you visit the Blessed Sacrament, uh, you have an examination of conscience at the end of the day, you go to bed on time, you're perfect. Well, in a way, I think that's true. You know, I mean, this is not terribly complicated. It's to order our lives to the truth at the heart of our, uh, of our being, which is, to see ourselves as one of those two luminously and two or two only luminous and self evident beings governing ourselves. Newman says the most important thing we can do is to live in the presence of God. There's no, no place you escape that reality. Um, and he said the great risk for the Christian is there's a, a certain part of our lives that we, we try to keep in reserve. You know, well, the, the things that come easy to us are quite related to the price. The thing, this one little section or several sections. We don't want penetrated because that's where we are truly individuals. But for them to know, I mean, our lives must be fully given to God. And every moment we must really be realizing that we're in His presence. And if we're in His presence at every moment, then the conscience can function, right? Because uh, we're realizing that we're not living in our own secret faults, but we're, we're, we're truly present. So for him, it's not a complicated question, but it's, it's, a, it's a demanding reality. Newman says that religion doesn't come natural to people, most people. It's, it's hard because our inclination is to protect ourselves, not to give ourselves away. But if, if in fact the conscience is rightly oriented to God in the way uh, it should, then living in God's presence is not something we fear, it's something.